Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In this episode of Writing Matters, Greg Garner and I have an opportunity to talk about the ways that coaching works. What is it that we can do to honor the experiences of those that we coach, listen intently and with purpose, and then help them become better at communicating their message to the world. Welcome to Writing Matters. In this episode, we speak with Greg Garner, who is a former middle school teacher turned instructional technology coach turned corporate trainer and is currently a PhD student in learning design at North Carolina State University. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and we've been able to connect in the past through our shared work uh, with Writable, so we'll probably talk a little bit about that today, and also your experience working with everyone from adolescents to adults and in so many contexts, including your work at the Friday Institute. So with all that in mind, one of the questions that I've been trying to get from everyone at the beginning of the episodes this year is just to find out about your path, which has clearly taken you to many places in the world of education. How did you get to where you are at today? Uh, what have been stops on your educational journey? Yeah, so I my undergrad degree is actually in business administration. And uh, when I graduated, it was right around the time that there was this little thing called a recession happening, which is a great time to have a business degree and no experience. And one thing that I'd always been interested in is teaching and just helping others to come to these realizations that I had come to in, in my own learning. And so I um, started working as a sixth and eighth grade math and technology teacher and As I got into that, I I found I really enjoyed it. I moved into instructional coaching. I found I really enjoyed working with teachers who, uh, instead of me just working with 160 students, I was working with teachers that would represent over 1,000 students at a couple of different middle schools that I was at. And uh, through that journey, I made made some connections and talked to some some folks and got, uh, continued to hone my craft and, and had the opportunity to join the Friday Institute out of NC State the College of Education. And uh, through that work, I was able to work with schools, so teachers and administrators and students all across the state of North Carolina. Um, And and in North Carolina, we have this expression where we say, from Manio to Murphy. And Manio is this town that is in the far east part of the state, and Murphy is in the far west part of the state. And I was fortunate enough to actually get to work with schools that were east of Manio and west of Murphy. So when, when folks say that they're working from Manio to Murphy, I, I, I like to say that I've gotten beat. Wow, that's pretty incredible. So you said just a moment ago that you really appreciated that transition moving into that role of instructional coach and then moving into the Friday Institute. What would you say are some of the similarities and differences between adult learners and um, our young people that we might work with? What, what might someone be surprised to know, hey, it really stays the same no matter what the <laughs> age. And then what, what are some things that you found unique about teaching other teachers and especially teaching other teachers about writing? Yeah, so working with both adolescents and with adults, one of the things that you really uh, are confronted with very quickly is um, everyone is a learner. And everyone has this process that they need to go through. They need to confront things that they previously believed to be true. They need to figure out and wrestle with them and figure out what mental models need to be broken down. How are they going to be able to move forward to um, better appreciate the the new learning that needs to take place? And that's true no matter your age. And And I think that for the best learners, they're able to recognize when that process is taking place and they're able to better address um, the the deconstruction and reconstruction of those mental models. Um, For folks that are having a little bit more difficulty with it, it, uh, there's there's this pervasive belief that I was constantly confronted with, particularly working with adults, of, well, I'm just not a technology person. And what was fascinating is being able to make the move from uh, students to adults is that I had students who would say, I'm just not a technology person. And so 
whether you're 14 or you're 40 or you're 64, uh, we, we constantly had this language that would creep up that would say, well, I'm just not that person, that person that you think I should be, that person that you want me to be. And so oftentimes it's not about content. It's not about what I need you to learn or what this new tool is or how, you know, how is it that you can be successful in this new way? It's about believing that you can. And so in, in many ways, I, there's a little bit of that kind of in motivational speaker <laughs> that kind of creeps in. And I'm by no means a Tony Robbins. I'm by no means someone who's going to go out and get a crowd all pumped up at a pep rally. Uh, but you have to have a little bit of that, whether you're working with students or with adults. Uh, it's, it's just it's a necessary component of trying to figure out how are we going to give people, regardless of age, what they need to be successful. Um, in terms of differences, there are definitely some unique challenges. Uh, for one, uh, students are much more uh, amenable to a compliance-based mentality. And you can say, put your phone away. And they can say, well, I don't want to. And you can say, you're going to put your phone away or you're going to X. And whatever the punishment is, whether it's loss of some sort of privileges or a visit to some administrator's office, whatever the situation may be. Uh, with adults, when you say, put your phone away, uh, it's a little bit of a different social contract that you're dealing with. And so some of the same behaviors may arise, but then how, as you as a facilitator of learning are going to deal with those uh, manifest behaviors, uh, sometimes a little bit different. And you have to have some different tricks up your sleeve to be able to uh, handle the different situations that arise. Oh, I just have to know, how do you deal with adult learners with the phone? It sounds like you've uh, had that happen <laughs> once or twice. A couple of times. And uh, at least for me, um, I always dealt with it just one-on-one -on -one, and I just ask questions. And I just want to know things like, you know, is there something going on? Um, is there, you know, I, I know that we all have other places that we're thinking about and other things, other priorities that are competing. And um, I understand that, you know, you may not be here of your own volition, um, but is there anything that I can do to help you be more present? Um, and I, it's very uh, difficult, very tricky to be able to deliver that in a way that doesn't come across as being, you know, smarmy or, or being even sarcastic. Um, I'm trying my best not to deliver in, in a way that triggers a shame response, but at the same time, I do need them to know that their, their mental and physical presence is, is necessary for learning to take place. Yeah. I appreciate the way you just phrased that question. How can I help you be more present? You know, that puts a little bit of responsibility back on the instructor as well. And, and yet also acknowledges the agency of the learner. So that's great. So as you think about your current work, especially with adult learners, but also just across the, the time that you've spent in many classrooms and in many ways, are, are there ways that you see writing especially valuable um, as you've developed your perspective on learning design, as you've developed this perspective on what students need, be them 14 or 44 or 64? What is it that you find uh, works well? Is there a, a lesson, a trick, a tip, a strategy? Um, how are you finding writing fitting into your role um, as a learning designer? Yeah, so I think for me, I had this revelation not too terribly long ago, and uh, it's going to be just it's going to be eye roll worthy for those that are deeply entrenched in writing instruction. But for me and, and in a lot of my work, it, it was something that um, it took me a minute to really let it resonate uh, and to, to ring true. And that is writing at its core is about the communication of ideas. And that was something that I had not fully taken to heart uh, in a lot of my work. And I, it, that sounds odd, but in my previous writing instruction and the way that I always handled it, it was always very technical. It was always about uh, the crafting of a message. It was always about this kind of um, medium over message almost. It was, it was so focused on uh, how are we going to fit these words together in a particular syntactical way? How are we going to um, craft a narrative? And when you focus exclusively on the technical you lose what writing's purpose really is. And when I step back and I'm able to read the words of 
of an eighth grader who has really, in according to their academic history, um, their previous teachers would tell you that they struggle as a writer. Mm-hmm. And when you start looking for what is the meaning in their text, not how are we going to judge their grammar and their, their punctuation and their spelling, and, and that's all important, but how well are they able to communicate their ideas? And when you take a step back and you start thinking about that and you broaden what it means to communicate ideas, it opens up more possibilities for improvement. It opens up more possibilities for relationships to expand. Um, It also opens up possibilities for what else writing might mean. And what I've, one of the things I've been able to do is um, think about these new emergent fields that a lot of folks are really interested in, and and whether we call it STEM or STEAM or STREAM or, uh, I mean, there's so Mm -hmm. many different variants. um, And and one of the big ones lately has been the CS for All initiative. And, and that's how do we get computer science into more classrooms? And I really think the answer of how we get more computer science into more classrooms is that we understand that we're already doing a lot of computer science. We just have this mental model, this, this idea that computer science is somehow other. It's somehow separate. And computer science at its core is also about the communication of ideas. So if we think about writing and we think about coding and we think about computer science and we think about how are we going to construct meaning in our readers' minds, it opens up the possibilities for what we can do with the written word, whether that syntax is in the form of a programming language, whether it's in the form of a five-paragraph essay. We have the ability to approach learners where they are and to build on their current set of strengths rather than think about how do we move them towards my goal for writing, how can I move them towards their goals for communicating their ideas? Mm -hmm. I definitely appreciate that connection that you made there. I've been speaking with other guests this season about the literacy and making literacy and STEM literacy and kind of computational thinking types of ideas. And I think sometimes that can be a little scary for an English language arts teacher to feel like, oh, now you want me to teach coding? Um, and yet seeing it as part of a larger communicative act definitely makes sense. I appreciate the way that you describe that. So, so tell us a little bit more about your, your work with coaching um, teachers and now just coaching other adults. Um, what are the ways in which um, you help somebody become a better educator? What are the ways in which that happens, maybe you can talk specifically about the teaching of writing, but just in general, what, what are the ways that you open up those conversations? Um, I always like to say I try to honor the voices around the table, honor the experience, but even that's a little challenging. So tell us how you do it. What, what is it that you're, um, what is your stance? What is your approach when you're working um, in those coaching situations? Yeah, so the first thing that I try to confront, and, and it starts with listening, um, but the first thing I'm trying to listen for and, the, and therefore confront is when is the deficit mindset creeping in and eroding the foundation that we're supposed to be building on? And so when we bring our preconceived notions, and I, this references this notion of I'm just not that person, I'm not a technology person, I'm not a math person, I'm not a good writer. We, we ascribe identity to ourselves, and then it affects our ability to augment or to alter that identity. And so for me, effective coaching really begins at its core with, and as trite as it sounds, it is true relationships. And if I have not earned the trust and credibility of the other folks that are in the room, why would they listen to me? Why would they try to adopt some new practice? Why would they try some crazy idea when they've already had a career that's worked for them? And whether that career is professional and they've been in the classroom and and they've received a paycheck for what they do, or whether it's an academic career and they're 14 years old and they've been at this for nine years, and why is this crazy guy going to alter the way that I think about how I can advance from one grade to the next? And so when I'm, especially when I start thinking about writing, writing is so personal. And I've been told for, for several years that I'm, I'm a good writer. And I hear this over and over about, oh, you're, you're a good writer. And I question that simply because what, 
what they're really saying, what I believe that they're really saying is that I have a way to communicate my ideas. And I think that's, a, that's just what it comes back to. And so as we uh, think about the communication of ideas, it can change the way that we teach writing instruction because now what I'm doing, I'm looking for patterns. And so as you mentioned computational thinking and how are we going to you know, bridge these two worlds, one of the big tenets of computational thinking is pattern recognition. As I'm reading a text, I'm looking for those patterns. I'm looking for the ways that the syntax will carry from one character to the next or the ways that it doesn't carry and how is each character taking on their own identity and what are the ways that we're building this story arc and how are we leveraging what's taking place within the story to be able to create a new possibility in the future down whether it's down the road in this story or possibly in a sequel. Um, but even in nonfiction writing, what are the ways that I am able to use patterns that I've recognized in other texts to be able to bring home my point, what it is that I'm trying to say? And one of the things that I um, really appreciated is uh, a, a colleague of mine at the Friday Institute um, was describing to me when they work with teachers, and particularly around literacy efforts, that oftentimes teachers will um, not deride, <laughs> but they will certainly uh, encourage their students to look beyond uh, trite sayings. They, they want students to use more than just the same phrases over and over. They want to move past the cliche. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is important. Uh, it's also important to understand where did that cliche come from? When did they pick that up? Is that something that they brought to the text honestly? Is that something that they heard somewhere else? Uh, is there a way that we could start with what's cliche and remix it and break convention and think about, hey, this is a clever saying and everyone knows this, but if we were to add our own spin to it, you just put your own mark on language. And how can you then use language to drive home a really clever point? And so for me, uh, whenever I'm coaching, whenever I'm working with uh, another person uh, of any age, I, I want to start with what are the ways that uh, they can build on who they are and where they are, uh, and what are the ways that I can challenge some of the preconceived notions about uh, what they are or often are not capable of doing yet, uh, and how can we build on those successes to create a new, uh, a new future. That's great. Building on who you are and where you are. And then also, I appreciate how you just said that, you know, how are you using language? How did you come to use language in this way? Helping them understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and the ways in which it might impact the audience. Again, in the broader context of that communicative act, that's pretty interesting. So you see that kind of translating into their, their speech and the way that they talk and interact with their own students or other colleagues, as well as what they put on paper or the screen. That's pretty interesting. So as you think then about um, how you coach and knowing that not all teachers have opportunities to have coaches, um, at risk of giving away all your secrets, are there any kind of... Uh, self-coaching tips are there are there a series of questions or maybe like a heuristic that you kind of use when you're moving through a coaching session that uh someone could kind of use as their own moment of reflection and analysis oh that's a great question um and i I'll preface all of this by saying that I have no proprietary secrets and, and anyone is welcome to anything and everything that I have to offer. <laughs> if they find it valuable, take it and run. Um, it's, it should be about building practice and, and helping more folks to be able to achieve what they want to achieve. And uh, to anything that serves that end, I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, in terms of kind of heuristics and things that I'm chewing on or thinking about as, as I enter into a session, I think maybe one of the most pressing issues for me and, and where I get myself in trouble uh, is I, I jump ahead and I mm -hmm. diagnose uh, and I try to, I feel as though my experience and my prior uh, interactions have given me insight into where I believe this person to be going, I be, where I can try to suss out where I think they're headed. And when I do that too early in the process, when I, when I don't listen uh, well, it causes me to 
start giving suggestions, start uh, passing along ideas that I've heard from other people, and it doesn't fully appreciate the uniqueness of their own situation. Um, and so the, the mantra that I really give myself is listen first. Um, and I'm frequently finding myself in a space where I need to make sure I am listening to understand and not listening to respond. And so when I do that well, when I listen well, um, and I'm able to hear where they're coming from, it always leads to more questions. And it mm. always leads to uh, this kind of heart of, of understanding where I want to I wanna learn more about what makes you say that. Um, I, I, I often use a lot of the uh, Ron Richard um, metacognition frames, and uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of his work and uh, what he's done with um, this making thinking visible movement. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks see that as a, a tool or a set of tools to be used with these five and six year olds, because that's kind of who he was thinking about when he was initially developing it. Yep. I find it tremendously valuable myself um, when I take the time to pause and say, well, what makes me say that? You know, or when I tell myself, hey, tell me more. Right? I have this internal dialogue that says, there's something else going on here. What is it? And uh, it, it starts sounding almost kind of cognitive behavioral therapy-like, where I'm, I'm almost having a little therapy session with myself. Uh, but I also find that it's really valuable to be able to process what's, what's happening in another person's brain. Uh, what life experiences do they have that they're bringing to the table that I'm unaware of? And until I ask questions, until I learn more about them and just build relationship, there's no way I'm going to be able to provide any suggestions. Right. Well, even picking up on what you just said, like the tell me more, like I think that's an incredible pedagogical move. Not only can it buy you a little bit of time if somebody <laughs> has said something where you're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But um, also, yeah, it's just, it, it's like you, you, you nod and you acknowledge what they've said. And, and just by expressing that curiosity and that genuine reciprocity, um, it brings something else out of, of the person that you're listening to. So that's valuable too. Great. So I know um, it's kind of uh, hard to always try to narrow down to just one thing, uh, whether that might be a book or a blog or a TED Talk or someone you follow on Twitter or um, a new website or app. But we're really curious, and especially as it relates to uh, teaching writing, is there anything that's been on your radar screen or anyone that's been on your radar screen lately that you might be able to point out? Um, actually, lately, I've spent a lot of time, this is going to sound totally off the wall. Lately, I've spent a lot of time um, reading up more about surveillance capitalism, <laughs> and um, particularly as we start talking about tools like Turnitin and mm. the um, the notion that we're going to create a sec essentially a police state of our of our students, um, and we're looking for ways that they're cheating. We're we're seeking out. We we have this underlying belief that they're doing everything they can to skirt the system. Um, and I think that the tools that we use are are reflections and also reinforcements of our pedagogical beliefs and of our developmental beliefs about the learners that we're working with. And so whenever I'm uh, reading. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to spend a lot of time really digesting is what's taking place behind the scenes here. And so uh, one person in particular that I'm, I'm really grateful for here is Jesse Stommel. Uh, Jesse Stommel has done some really tremendous work um, to, to unpack what's taking place with our assumptions. And he, his, a lot of his work is mostly at the higher ed level, but I think uh, anyone can agree that it has broad implications for uh, learners of all ages. And as we think about the tools that we use, uh, what is it that we are reinforcing? And so small plug for Writable, of course, that uh, it, it speaks volumes that a tool like Writable is taking the model of students writing and rather than trying to turn it into a cheating detection system or a plagiarism detector and these, these other kinds of tools, is instead using peer review and peer feedback to be able to, um, to, to better uh, 
support and scaffold students so that they're able to be exposed to new variances of language. They're able to be able to think critically about not only their own writing, but the writing of their peers. Um, and I really, I mean, my desire for, for educators of all stripes would be that we, we think critically about what is the underlying message that's being communicated to our students and how is that bettering them, not just as writers, but also as citizens. And how are they going to be able to uh, promote and extend the systems in which they're being exposed and is that going to be beneficial for them uh, developmentally and into the future? Absolutely. Yeah, the, that point that you just made um, and I was trying to multitask slightly to look up Jesse's work and his website. I, I know he's as connected with uh, another organization which I'm totally drawing a blank on right now. So do you know what He's connected. Uh, I'd have to look it up. Okay, uh, sorry, I won't multitask while we're recording okay. too much. <laughs> um, but no, this last point that you made, like, what is it that the overt and more importantly, the implicit, you know, message that's being sent to students when they have to use a system uh, that, as you said, suggests right off the bat that they are cheating? Um, that puts the default position of the the teacher and the student in a very different role. And one of the things I will often try to describe um, when I'm teaching at tech classes is that we have to ask a few questions. You know, what does this technology assume about teachers and about the act of teaching? What does it assume about learners and the act of learning? And then what are the unintended consequences uh, that this might have? So yeah, you're definitely resonating with some of the thoughts that I have. So that's great. So Jesse will uh, definitely put his information in the show notes and he is Jessifer on Twitter. So thank you. Well, as we kind of come to a close in here, um, you know, in the broadest possible sense, can you talk about the word the way that you feel writing um, has influenced you and brought you to where you are now, but then also as a PhD student who is probably doing <laughs> more writing than you ever thought was possible, but will continue to be a writer in the future, um, what impact does writing have on your life? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I'm really grateful for the folks that I've had throughout my life that have uh, worked diligently to help me to be able to express the things that are taking place inside of me and to be able to put language to things that you feel. Um, and I think that that's one of the toughest, um, toughest things to teach um, because, uh, and particularly if you think about teaching in a middle school, um, who even knows what you're feeling? And it's so difficult to be able to really pin that down. And so, um, I've had a lot of support along the way, and so writing is, is very important to me uh, as a means of communication um, and also uh, something that we, we haven't talked a lot about, but as a means of reflection and a, and a means of me to be able to explore uh, what's happening in my own head and in my own heart, um, to be able to really kind of go through and chew on this and think about this and, uh, and to process my day. And um, as I read um, some biographies, even, I, I learn about all these uh, great women and men throughout history and how many of them kept daily journals that were just reflections of their day. Mm -hmm. And I think early in my career, I would have considered that a, uh, an unnecessary uh, extravagance to say, well, I didn't really do anything today, so I bother reflecting on it. But the more I spend time in reflection, the more I'm able to, able to process the day's events, the more I'm able to see how this day connected to this to a day last week or a day last month or even a day last year, uh, and I'm able to grow and I'm able to experience some of the same events in new ways because I know how better to respond because I've spent time reflecting on those types of events categorically. And so for me, writing is an essential uh, tool of growth. Uh, it's an essential mechanism by which I not only express what I'm feeling, but also be able to process what I'm feeling. Uh, and I, I just, I think it's invaluable. Um, a, a big drive of wanting to pursue a PhD in the first place uh, was to be able to uh, better support those who are uh, in a learning experience and wanting to, to really be able to understand how is it that, that someone learns and in a given situation, how do we support that learning? And the more I read, the more I write, uh, the more I find that reading and writing are invaluable 
means and valuable processes by which learning can take place. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate how you said that uh, it connects your head and your heart and it gives you that opportunity to really uh, process all the different pieces, both in your, your life as an educator, as well as just the world at large, because it's a strange and complicated place and we do need to periodically pause and take time to reflect on it. So Greg, thank you so much for being our guest on Writing Matters. We appreciate your time and all that you do with and for educators and wish you all the best as you continue in your PhD program. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Thanks for having me on tonight. Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.